This is a session for the participants on your IPS is your GPS. I like that catchy title. Ellen Spong is the Director of Institutional Advisory Group. She is the Senior Vice President and Director of Institutional Advisory Services at Atlantic Union Bank. For more than 30 years, she has worked with nonprofit organizations, foundations, and endowments to support their philanthropic goals through policy development and management of investment assets. This includes charitable trusts and other philanthropic instruments. She previously worked with Wells Fargo as Senior Vice President of Philanthropic Services for SunTrust Bank as Managing Director of the Foundations and Endowment Specialty Practice. She also served as Director of Plan Giving for the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation. She holds a bachelor's degree in government and foreign affairs from the University of Virginia, is a member of the LEAD Virginia class of 2013, and is a chartered advisor in philanthropy. Well, if I can say that word three times, I'll be good. Okay, welcome Ellen and welcome Michael. We are looking forward to your presentation. Well, thank you, Melissa, and thank you very much. It's great to be here, even though we are here in person. So hopefully uh, next, next year or coming years, we'll have that opportunity. Um, as you mentioned, I'm here with my colleague, uh, Mike Snow, who I've worked with for many, many years. He is a senior portfolio manager, works in our, on our institutional team, and uh, he will uh, be participating in this presentation as we go through certain elements on uh, the IPS is your GPS. Now, Melissa, I have a question for you. Is Jim Freeze uh, at, having, at jury duty today? No, he is on. Oh, he's on. Okay, well, my story yeah. won't have quite as much quite as much humor to it, but I nonetheless <laughs> will. <laughs> but uh, as you gathered uh, from the introduction, uh, we work with non I work with nonprofit organizations as part of our specialty practice here at Atlantic Union Bank. Um, we also serve on a number of nonprofit boards. So from the from the presentation's perspective, we're bringing multiple perspectives to this discussion, uh, both as serving clients that we have, but also being clients and serving as volunteers in the community. And the, the idea uh, for this presentation uh, really came from the number of investment policy statements that Mike and I probably looked at over our time. I, I too many to to number, but it, I found that they were sometimes really complicated, incomplete. Um, they weren't really clear in terms of roles and responsibilities that people who are participating in executing an IPS being the manager or board committee. And so I really started to think about this is one of the most important governance documents that a nonprofit organization has. And so how can you be an effective fiduciary if the main document that's driving this isn't clear or it isn't well understood or it's out of date. So I started to think about that um, and say, you know, how can, can we make this, you know, how could I develop something that really helps shine a little more light on that, makes this clearer, makes it easier for both uh, boards, for managers, and for those who are volunteers in the community. So started thinking about this, okay. An IPS is really sort of a fiduciary roadmap, if you will. It guides, it guides investing. It takes you down a road. And I thought, hmm, roadmap, fiduciary roadmap. And I thought, well, you know, this is an idea I'd really like to develop. All I need is a couple of three to four hours uninterrupted creative time. Whoever has that. Well, then came jury duty. So I thought if Jim Freeze is going to be on jury duty, since he asked me to do this, that was a nice connection. But I got called for jury duty about, 82, about two years ago. And we were told that we would be in the jury room from 8 a.m. to maybe 2 p.m. That is a lot of time with no cell phone, no internet. You really can't talk to anybody. You can bring something to read. So I thought, well, I'm going to take it. This is a perfect opportunity, except I didn't have any paper. So I went to the jury office and borrowed some paper out of their, their copier and started developing this sort of idea about, you know, an IPS is a roadmap for accomplishment of a mission by a nonprofit, very much the way you would plan a trip or plan a journey with a goal. And then I thought, well, 
when have I ever gone on a trip anywhere where I haven't needed a GPS? So I had this aha moment of your IPS is your GPS. So that's how this title came about. Uh, but it, it, it's very interesting in terms of thinking about how you plan a trip, how you set a goal, the steps that you take along the line, the people that you need to help with, how things work together. Uh, it fits. And so we really have had fun with this. So if I look at Take Us and then here's our version, here's your version of that roadmap. If you think about it, a mission, that's the destination of an organization. It's why it exists. Who's going to be working and helping you get to that destination? Roles and responsibilities, manager, board. What are the objectives? What are the financial objectives that you need to accomplish along the way? What's going to help advance the mission? Looking at risk timeline. How long do you have to get there? What kind of risk do you want to take along the way? And then from there, developing an asset allocation, constructing a portfolio, and establishing a basis for measuring success. Walks right up, you go right sort of down that road, if you will, and the reporting that's needed to exercise that fiduciary responsibility. And then you have a history, a process, a document process. So thinking about this with the image of a trip. I went, decided last summer, we're still sort of in COVID, nobody was sure planning to take a train trip to Portland, Oregon. So I'm thinking, okay, am I going to uh, drive there or am I going to hire someone to do that? So keeping that in mind, let's take these nine components of an IPS, a fiduciary roadmap, translate them into planning what we would do to take a trip. Fortunately, nine divided by three equals three. So we've started this presentation up into sort of three blocks. One in which is establishing a framework, which is your plan, mission, roles, goals. What's the, what are you gonna map out? What's your route? What resources do you need? And then how do you measure progress? How do you define success along the way? So in each of these components, and Mike's gonna join me in this conversation, we're gonna talk through some of the key issues, the key decisions, the decision points that we're going to take along this journey. Let's see if I can reach it. There we go. All right, mission first. That is the destination. So when I decided to take a trip to Portland, Portland was the destination. What was the purpose? I wanted to see a part of the country I hadn't before. So when you think about mission, What's the purpose of the funds? What's the history of the organization? What is the vision? So that is got to be first and foremost. There are many investment policy statements that I've said that don't even have a mission in there. So it's difficult for a prospective donor who wants to give to your organization. And it may be difficult for board members who serve that understand, organization to really understand what the mon money is for. Roles and responsibilities. We're going to spend some time talking about this because this is one of the pitfalls that I find in a lot of IPS is when there's confusion about who's doing what. So if you apply it to the trip I took, okay, if I want to go across country, do I really want to drive that distance by myself? Or do I want to have somebody who does that every day? Or do I want to take a train as I did or fly a plane? So we're going to weave that into the discussion of oversight, management, and discretion versus non-discretion. I think about a professional, someone who can help me meet my objectives, which might be safety, great scenery, fun and re relaxation. Am I going to rely on someone like myself to do that who doesn't do it every day? Or if I'm a volunteer committee member and I'm not managing portfolio every day, we're going to hire someone to do that. And then what are those objectives that come along that you need in order to advance the mission? As I mentioned, for a trip, it might be safety, scenery, fun and recreation. It may be some interesting stops, something historical that you want to see. So think of it in terms of those steps. And those are very necessary to set out that framework to begin with. If you don't set out the framework, it's really hard to build a portfolio, to establish an asset allocation, and to move forward with your investment strategy. 
So going back to roles and responsibilities, and Mike and I'll talk about this a little bit, is ways to highlight the fiduciary responsibility of the board and of the manager. So you have rules and regulations around, you have something called the Uniform Prudent Management of Institutional Funds Act, which is a mouthful, full, we call it a MIFA, that helps guide, guide those decisions and gives the board the authority to hire professionals. So let's talk a little about oversight versus management. If I'm on a train, I really want to have, be able to decide, is this a good, is a good trip? I want to be able to see what's going on. I don't want to have to actually be doing the driving. When I think about the fact that if I were doing it myself, there's some risk there. You get tired. It's a long trip. There's some things that you keep that you have to sort of do as, as part of that management role. Do you really want to be doing that as a volunteer on the committee? So when you think about is the role oversight, is the role management, you get into discretion or non-discretion. Discretion is when I give to that conductor of that train the responsibility of getting me to my destination safely as opposed to if you're driving in a car and you've been given a recommended route by somebody sitting in the back seat telling you what to do, but ultimately you're responsible for that safety and getting there, what happens if you have an accident? You're the driver, you're responsible, not the person who's given you the instructions or making the recommendation. Mike, I think this is probably an area that we spend a lot of time talking to clients about and helping basically trying to take apart, if you no will, rules and responsibilities. So talk a little about what your, your experiences have been um, and, and how we really had to deal with yeah, that discussion. No doubt, Ellen. Uh, yeah, there's, um, for me personally, uh, experiencing being on boards, being even on investment committees and, and being in, in, you know, sitting in that, that side of the table per se, if you wanna use kind of that terminology, um, I've had a whole new appreciation as far as what capacity I'm acting within versus if I were actually driving the ship or, uh, you know, pulling the strings as far as managing the portfolio. Um, it's very easy for, you know, a committee member or board member to maybe want to overstep bounds, but knowing, you know, that, that, in that fiduciary role that they're acting on behalf and it's the trust of where they've enlisted this professional and their fiduciary aspects of how they are in best interest for the organization or or the company then you you kind of have to rationalize and balance that out and and it's it, it was a real eye-opener um but again i'm I, i'm probably one of the uh, um you know better investment committee members you know because i have that appreciation for how it's being done, but I know the mechanics of how it's working. So, uh, you know, it's 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 that balance there that you have to appreciate and you have to kind of arc back to that role and responsibility. Well, it's, it's interesting. I remember back many, many years ago that investment committees didn't feel like they were doing their job unless they were actually directing investments. And markets have changed, times have changed, investment options have changed. It's certainly gotten to be complex. And I know that, like you, I've, I'm on an investment committee and I don't want to be making those decisions or even voting on affirming specific investment decisions because I'm not looking at that portfolio every day and I'm not in, in the throes of, of managing the very specific details of those investments. Even though this is what I'm involved in for a living, I'm a volunteer. And so there's a real distinction there. I'm going to talk a minute about investment objectives because this is what moves, moves the organization forward in terms of accomplishing your mission. And very quickly, what are those objectives would be, you know, on, on, on that road, if you will? Uh, spending needs. Uh, protecting the assets against inflation or preserving purchasing power. Administrative cost. So we talk with a lot of committees and sometimes if you're spending, like I'm gonna use my hands here, 4%, if you have a 4% spin, I'll move my hand to the credit, and then say inflation is two, and then maybe you have costs that are one, 
what you need to cover from an investment perspective long term is not just four percent it's that seven percent to truly preserve the value of those assets long term so taking these first three components together and we're going to move on to what you need to do or what a committee do or what a policy statement needs to outline if i could go in the right direction this go this is what happens when you let me do the driving so let me illustrate that uh, what you need to do in order to put that strategy forward and i would say that these three areas this assessing risk time horizon liquidity needs things like that developing an asset allocation and constructing a portfolio are some of the most critical pieces of an investment policy statement that need to be clear that need to be well thought out that need to be a collaboration between the manager and the board or committee and this is where having a discretionary manager really does make a difference it doesn't mean that you at this at a committee has abdicated that responsibility it means it's a part of the active discussion but once these elements are set in place the manager has to execute against them so this is a very robust discussion right now obviously one of the, the primary question i have with any any organization if they've got short-term funds or intermediate term funds or endowment funds is what is the money here for when do you need it how much risk are you willing to take along the way it's kind of like it's back to the road trip when do you want to get there how much risk are you going to take the mountain route are you going to take the highways are you going to take the back roads and what happens if you run into construction so there are all kinds of things just keeping that uh, that travel theme alive and it's really important that once those those needs are determined and you set out those objectives developing an asset allocation that's going to meet those objectives if those don't match up you're going to be in trouble right off the bat in addition to that what are the the basic investment options that you have to fulfill that asset allocation things have gotten much more complex it used to be just stocks and bonds and there were mutual funds then were exchange traded funds so the investment industry has really evolved and we're also when you think about the dynamics of the market and the time we live in we're also dealing with a market that is at historic highs and we're dealing with a bond market and interest rates that are at historic lows so one of the most robust discussions that mike and i have with clients and the discussions we have in our volunteer roles is what is that what should that asset allocation be to meet those objectives how's the market changed what is it that we need to consider in order that this will help us meet our objectives so Mike, I mean, this is about the hottest topic I think you and I have had in the last two or three weeks um, with committees and just talking it through is. that. And, and, and it's, yeah, it's been ongoing. It's, uh, and, and it will continue to be, I mean, as Ellen mentioned or alluded to, the uh, things have changed. Uh, there, there's a lot of different vehicles and, and ways to get to the means um, uh, of the objectives, you know, backing up to the primary objectives for the foundation. but. I think in generalized terms, what we're seeing in investment policies that we're reviewing is, you know, there's good intentions. Uh, you know, there's, there's uh, you know, a great framework. There's great uh, coordination and of, of, from a top down, from a, an overall market cycle. So, or multiple market, market cycles that with that kind of allocation that it should be appropriate. Um, but what we're seeing is, you know, there are a lot of policies that, you know, an intent to be uh, to control risk. They've also uh, alleviated or, or lessened the ability to capture returns, and and part of that's by the limit uh, uh, prohibiting certain types of investment vehicles. And so that's more of an education piece of what we've been going through uh, about how. The different types of risk that are balanced out you know the, the the risk of volatility but also the risk of inflationary the risk of the over launch of, of liquidity uh slow growth environment that we're forecasting moving forward uh, all those things have balanced out into some pretty robust conversations with committees and this is also where and, and i was going to say at the beginning when you simplify and make clear or straightforward a policy like this 
these are policies that can work for half a million dollars or $500 million. It is still very important to have clarity and simplicity as you go through this. As I've always said, the, the people who can explain it the best know it the best. So spend some time in terms of putting, you know, developing an asset allocation, constructing a portfolio in terms and in manners that everybody understands what the, the goal is because this is when we get to reporting and monitoring success is really important if you if you if it's not clear um in terms of what you're trying to accomplish and why you're trying to accomplish it uh, it becomes a really difficult from an oversight perspective it becomes very difficult from a management perspective so this is probably you know i'd say in terms of robust discussions but where we spend a lot of time because if this doesn't match the organization's objectives. And you see a reference in here to social impact and environmental, social and governance type strategies. This is becoming more and more an area of interest for nonprofit organizations that ties into the mission. So again, these pieces, these blocks build, these elements build on each other. And you also have to go back and check, are we doing things that are in the best interest of accomplishing the mission long-term? Is it consistent with who we are, what we stand for? So that again, starts to broaden that conversation. Okay, we've gotten down, we've gone down down the road here. Uh, we've got our resources. We've constructed our portfolio. We kind of think we we are on the way to to uh, to our destination. Um, I've enjoyed the dining car every day of the week on my train trip. But um, how are we going to manage? How are we going to measure success? You've done this. What is the measurement? How do you measure progress? How do you Ellen? measure success? Yes. Um, we do have a hand raised, so I thought I might want to check in with that person. Okay. Benton Nunn. I would love to. We would love to. I knew you would love to hear from someone. So, Benton, if you had a question, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. I've unmuted you, so you can um, unmute yourself and then ask. I have no questions at this time. Okay. All right. Sorry, your hand was up. So, all right. Sometimes people will click a hand. It's okay. Well, all right. So, it's up there. I would. We would welcome questions. We had some polling questions in here. There's a lot. There is. You know, the one thing about this this particular presentation is we could spend an hour on every one of these elements. There are so many stories. So, I really would encourage people to ask questions. Um, Mike and I hear each other talk a lot, and uh, we would love to hear from those in the audience and what's on, on your mind and what your experiences have been. It's the whole point of, of learning. Uh, so I encourage everyone to, uh, to, to not be shy about raising your hand. Uh, the, the last, you know, sort of really third of this with respect to investment policy statements, as I said before, is how you measure success. Is your strategy working? Does it need to be tweaked? Um, are there some things that we need to, they need to do differently or better? So establishing benchmarks is one of the keys. And I can't tell you how many investment policy statements I've seen that don't have any benchmarks in them. So how does the committee know how they're doing versus goals? How does the manager know they're doing versus goals? There is a primary goal, I think, with every organization in investing, and that is to cover uh, those basic uh, those basic needs, the organizational goals, that 4% spend, protecting against inflation, any costs related to the investments. So you know right away that you want to have that successful portfolio is at a minimum something that is going to generate, at least in the example I gave, 7% over the long term. Those may change up and down. So that's an organizational goal. But how do you manage the, you know, how are you going to measure the manager's skill in reaching that goal? You know, how are the investments that have been selected for the portfolio are performing? How are they working? Is the asset allocation really set correctly in terms of meeting those long-term objectives? So benchmarks, uh, which are also a very critical part of, of reporting as well, give a committee a way to assess how the portfolio is doing from an objective perspective. And Mike, you know, this has also been a, a, a key topic um, what are the benchmarks going to be? What kind of benchmarks are they going to be? Should they have multiple elements in them? Should they be one? Should they be CPI plus certain percent? 
So let's talk a little about what the benchmarks are and how that impacts the reporting uh, and oversight that a committee has. Hey, yeah, Alan, I'm just going to check really quickly. Did you want any of these poll questions launched yet? Um, we certainly can. We certainly can do that because I think that would be a part, great part of a little more of Q and A. Um, we have a few minutes for. So um, I think there's one on benchmarks. If there isn't, we can we can launch that later. But Mike, go ahead and let's talk about benchmarks, and then we can um, look at some of the polling questions. Okay. Yeah, it's, um, you know, Ellen is very, you know, uh, accurate in a lot of investment policy statements. It's, it's you know, well-built well investment policy statements. I mean, they're covered, you know, from, from A to Z, but you, you don't see that final component. You know, how, how are you measuring success? How are you measuring success that you're meeting the organization's needs? Did, as Ellen alluded to, it's, it's, it's whatever that spin rate, you know, an inflationary mark, you know, historically that's been like a 2% plug factor. We've seen that run a little heated here uh, as of recent. Uh, and, and cost, the overall cost to the portfolio, but to really grow and maintain that purchasing power of the assets, you know, into the future. Um, you know, so we, we, you know, the formulation to have something like that, but then down to the manager, you know, um, their skill with how they're investing, are they, you know, performing? Um, are they in line with what a reasonable expectation for the amount of risk that they're taking uh, with the assets? Is it uh, so? You know that that those are great things to have in place. And then there's also, you know, you want to as a committee and as a board and, and something we've all done, even in you know in my role in my shoes. Um, how are they performing against peers? You know, uh, do, is this manager performing based on the expectations uh, of what, you know, their competitors may? Um, so, you know, those are certain things that get ignored, but it's a very important piece uh, of, uh, as a board or a committee member, to be able to say that, yes, what we are doing and what we've laid forth is successful. And, you know, we, it's a good story to tell to, uh, you know, from a development side too, um, to be able to track and, and speak honestly to to the growth of of how their funds are being deployed and uh you know what fruits they're bearing into the future and that brings you to also how is the information on a portfolio being reported um are you doing it quarterly are you doing it semi-annually are you doing it annually uh those are all really important elements to be uh to be incorporated into uh, into the process. And again, it doesn't take a book that's two inches thick in order to give a committee what they need to do. And I have noticed this from uh, some of the boards I've been on that you get an awful lot of information. The key components, and you can put this in a policy statement, uh, is to, well, you don't want to tell them, you know, do three pages or less. But again, detail the information that you feel like the committee really needs and what intervals that you want them to report on, what benchmarks, to Mike's point, you want them to report on. Agree on meeting frequency, what the content's gonna be so that the board is in a committee is in a good position to make sound financial decisions or to, to use GPS language to recalculate. Uh, if necessary, in terms of going another direction, uh, maybe pursuing another manager, or certainly looking at something uh, that's a bit differently, because as at the end of the day, are held responsible for doing things that are in the best interests of the organization and to help advance that mission uh, going forward. So I think it's important to have within an IPS what the expectations are for reporting, including benchmarks, uh, the rhythm and the cadence of communication, and so that at the end of that investment policy statement, there is a section that says this will be reviewed annually and that you will at least look at how is it working and maybe a formal, an, an indication for a formal review on updating the investment policy statement, maybe every three to four years. Again, it keeps it fresh. Um, I think one of the polling questions I had, and again, I got so excited about what we're talking about, I forgot about the polling questions, but is, is are the IP is is the IPS current that people are people I think is this organization currently have an IPS and is it current 
Uh, as I said, Mike and I have seen a lot of IPSs, some of which I noticed there was one organization that was written in 2007 and hadn't been updated. Well, things have changed quite a bit since 2007. So uh, let's put up some of those questions and see what kind of feedback we get. Maybe that will generate some more questions uh, from the group. Okay, thanks, Ellen. So I put up uh, the first poll question. You may not be able to see it since you're running the slides, but um, our first one is, do the organizations you work for or work with have a current written IPS? We're already getting our votes in, so I'll give it um, a little bit longer and then I'll uh, share the results with everyone. Looks like we are leaning more towards um, yes. Give it a few more seconds and then I'll close this. Okay. So it ended up with 61% yes and then 39% no. And I'll wow. hide that and then, well, it's still up. That, that's okay. Well, that, that's interesting. I mean, Mike, I would, um, I'm certainly there is an opportunity there be, because if 30 o'clock, 40% of organizations don't have a written IPS and you've got investments. And this is also true of short-term investments. Um, exactly. There's some risk there to an organization uh, in terms of not having kind of that roadmap in place of what's allowable, what isn't allowable and a structure. So my comments there, I know we've worked with a number yeah. of organizations who created their IPS for the first time. Well, exactly. And you, and you kind of nailed it there when you discussed earlier about no, no no matter what the size, I mean, it may be a um, you know, half million dollar portfolio of assets and you know, maybe less than that. It could be up to you know, half a billion. Uh, and timelines, horizons, I mean, just because it may be a short term or purpose you know, niche of, of, of funds that may be there, you still need to have an overlay of how, what the expectations are and, and what the controls that maybe wanna be put in place, um, you know, the safeguards, uh, et cetera. So, um most certainly you know from from a startup to a well-existing you know an, an investment policy statement in ips uh, would be something worthwhile as a committee of board discussing and then seeking guidance or assistance you know as necessary yeah one of the risks that you have in addition to you know just the sort of overall fiduciary responsibility there is headline risk what if an investment is made that doesn't turn out so well uh, and there is no policy uh, in place to to guide that investing uh, that can make for a, sort of a, quite an embarrassing situation for an organization and also I think that that there is an expectation particularly around donors that if they are going to make a gift to an organization that they're going to invest in the future of that organization that there is a, a there's proper safeguards and policies in place. So it is an opportunity. I look at that as truly a development opportunity as well as a good structural and fiduciary responsibility to have something like that in place. So uh, hopefully, you know, what we've gone through today with these sort of nine elements uh, can help really be, be a good guide for putting together an IPS. Again, it doesn't have to be complicated. It needs to be very straightforward. Um, how about launching another one of the uh, polling questions, and we can talk uh, about that as well. I think there's one on asset allocation. We must have stumped the group. <laughs> well, 
earlier there. I'm sorry, yep. I didn't have my, my mic muted. I was sitting here talking to myself. So let me um, share that. Okay, so okay. we have 23% um, says yes and 77% says no. If if somebody didn't hear me talking and didn't get to vote, just put that in the question panel, please. Yeah. And could you repeat what the question Sorry. was? Okay, the question was, has your organization's asset allocation changed significantly in the past three years? So not that many. You know, that, that does make sense. When you, when, you, when you go through developing an investment policy statement, it, it really is supposed to be for long term. You may do some, some refinement of it, but I would say, Michael, the majority of our clients the asset allocations are substantially similar, although for the reasons that you highlighted with regard to historically low interest rates and very robust overvalued markets, that we have seen some change there. Most notably, I would say in lower allocations to fixed income instruments and probably more diversified or well, higher allocation to equity instruments, but also uh, the introduction of some alternatives uh, in that space that are correlated uh, that are not correlated, so providing additional uh, diversification and also can and sometimes enhance return on that fixed income side of the portfolio. So um, that's interesting. Anything you else want to add there? Does that surprise you? Uh, not not really. I mean, we've kind of been in a go go you know uh, grow market uh, you know for some time, and and you know we just came off of one of the longest cycles you know in um, in all time history, but. Um, I think, you know, probably if you're to look at any portfolio, they're probably, you know, on the upper ends of their equity ranges, you know, or, or to the targets. Um, and, you know, part of that is just, you know, the, the, the terminology of the TINA, that there is no alternative, you know, kind of the environment that's been brought about by the amount of liquidity in the markets. Um, it's, it's really made that fixed, in a lower interest rate environment too, it's really made it tough. Um, you know, from fixed income as an asset class and and you know on the horizon will be you know it's, it's not anything that's going to be cured overnight um so that's that is where you know I, I think you know in just looking at portfolios we've seen lowering there and diversifying into other non-traditional types of assets you know again that aren't as correlated to equity uh, uh but you know still perform in line or better than what historic uh you know fixed income um, pieces may be so it's m more so just a shift in 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 where we are in relation to the targets i would say 